Good evening, and welcome back to our long-running and perhaps most successful show here on BBC Seven, Blast from the Past. And we're delighted to welcome back to our studio Sir Cliff Richard this evening, not as the celebrated male vocalist and heartthrob, if I may add, but in his capacity of historian and literary critic. And hopefully, he'll shed some more light on the identity of Shakespeare. To be or not to be—that's the question. Was Shakespeare really the man from Stratford upon Avon, or was he perhaps somebody else? Welcome, Sir Cliff. It's very kind of you to fly in all the way from Barbados by helicopter, and we can't wait to hear your views on Shakespeare. Take it away, Sir Cliff. Uh, oh, well, thank you very much. I'm also delighted to be here. And、uh, Shakespeare has always fascinated me. When I was a little boy, better known as Harry Webb, I used to read sonnets all by myself. But also, I'd stage plays with my sister and parents. And Shakespeare's plays always held great fascination for me and my family. And I've always wondered who was behind Shakespeare, because it's hard to believe that, as you said, he was the son of a glove maker from Stratford. So I decided to analyse the title page of the sonnets. If we look at the simile of the 1609. Edition, the first thing that struck me was the way Shakespeare's was spelled with a hyphen, and also the lack of an apostrophe. Shakespeare's sonnets, two Shakespeare's, is a plural S, not the apostrophe S to indicate those sonnets were written by one Shakespeare. Shakespeare plus apostrophe S, if you see what I mean.、Uh, yes, Sir Cliff, we're getting the gist of what you're saying. Well, and then if I may continue, my dear fellow, the identity of, let's say, the social background of the real author is revealed on the very title page. If you take the very first letter, you know the alpha, the mystery being unravelled here, S, right? Nobody would argue with that. It would be initial letter S. Then the fact that those sonnets have been circulating among the noblemen of his time, the aristocrats, until they were printed. Here it's called imprinted. So let's take the second letter as I imprinted the printer's devil or the imp, the imp of the perverse, as Edgar Allan Poe called it. The letter that comes after imp is, of course, the R. So S I R, sir. The writer or the real author must have been a man active at court, of course. Today, people like Elton John become Sir Elton, and I myself have become Sir Cliff,、uh, called Cliff Tastic by the likes of Mr. Stevie Ricks. But in those days, aristocrats were born aristocrats, so let's establish that fact. Now, an aristocrat would not really mix socially with actors, you know. He accept praise from his peers, but he might sell his name or, you know, be reimbursed in some ways by accepting money. Hence, we find the pun, as nobody was called G. L. in those days. Not a single record has been found. It says at London by G. L. But if you take the slang term based on the Dutch word geld, as Frankie Paradiso has confirmed, my Dutch pal, geld really means, you know, it referred to money. So, in exchange for money or T. T. Another pun very common. Among Elizabethans, and what a lewd bunch they were! Tit for tat. Hank, the beer Marvin, please carry on. I love that lewd music in the background. Okay. After establishing this aristocratic identity or background, sir, on the title page, let's move on to the very first sonnet, the opening sonnet. From fairest creatures, we desire increase. What did the aristocrat look like? Well, he was the fairest, the most handsome man at court. Let's take after the description fair, the superlative ending est. The first letter is e, so sir e. We're getting somewhere, aren't we? Now, what were those courtiers occupied with? Well, they had basically nothing to do. They had lots of money and land and property, like me, does it? <laughs> desire. So, from fairest creature, we, the creatures we desire increase. Desire. There again, we have reiterated the aristocratic identity, S I R, Sir, but also the second letter of the name, Sir Ed. Now, many people were called Ed, short for Edward. So let's carry on with our identification process. So, Sir Ed, who was this Sir Ed? Where do we find the next letter? Let me see. If he wasn't Shakespeare, he held his own in a sense. We find in the fifth line, "Thou contracted to thine own bright eyes." If you look closely with bright eyes, own. So let's take the middle letter W, Sir Ed. Now the A can be found in the circumstances, it's social and financial circumstances, abundance. When we scroll down, to, so to speak, we'll find abundance. And putting on the third syllable, Edward dancing would be another pastime of the courtiers. Apart from pursuing des- desire, they spent a lot of time dancing. So Edward, where's the R? It's a kind of cruel fate in the next line. So finding oneself writing all of these wonderful plays, both comedies and tragedies and sonnets, not really receiving any credit where credit was certainly. Do so cruel with the R. Here we find Edward. D is another pun on the Globe Theatre where Shakespeare's plays were performed. World next line. So Sir Edward. Now that certainly narrows down the possibilities. Sir Edward. Now who was Sir Edward? Let's try and establish the D, D letter D, where credit is due in the final line to eat the world's due. 
Edward D. And again, very typical of Elizabethans, the E in the, that's who you are. As for the surname after Edward, uh, it's a very odd combination, isn't it? You know, being a nobleman, selling his name, his reputation to the son of a glove maker. So let's take that word odd, odd circumstances. An odd number will be three after the first one. Let's move on to sonnet number three. The opening line, of course, look in thy glass until the face thou viewest. If you look at the portrait of Shakespeare, the two lines running down from his ear to chin. And anybody can see that this man is wearing a mask. So who's behind that mask? Suppose we take the V of viewest. If you look closely at with the V, then if it's not Shakespeare, it's another man. The last word of the second line, another E, Edward de V. It's a fresh kind of unrealized solution in the third line. Fresh repair, if thou not reviewest, Edward the V. And finally, of course, it's a form of deception, a form of deceiving the world. Thou dost beguile the world, beguile the final E from Alpha to Omega. Edward, Sir Edward the Veer. Thank you very much. Good evening and God bless. Well, Sir Cliff, that's really quite an impressive analysis at breakneck speed. Perhaps too many coincidences to be true, but you have certainly shed some more light on this mystery, and we'll leave it to the listeners, including Alexander Wall, the grandson of the famous novelist and expert in this field, to decide whether Sir Cliff, whether you deserve credit where credit is due, to quote your own phrase. Sir Cliff, I'm really impressed, and I'll forgive you for your silly dance at the Eurovision Song Festival back in the day when you performed Power to All Our Friends. Oh yes, that was really embarrassing. I was kind of slightly ashamed of myself. Uh, somebody had slipped me a mickey, so to speak, and I, I couldn't help myself. It was indeed a silly dance. Please forgive me, and let's hope that this is kind of made up for that faux pas. Sitting alone upon my thought in melancholy mood, in sight of sea and at my back an ancient hoary wood, I saw a fair young lady come. Her secret fears to wear. Clad all in colour of a nun, and covered with a veil. Yet, for the day was calm and clear, I might discern her face, as one might see a damask rose hid under crystal glass. Three times, with her soft hand, full hard on her left side she knocks, and sighed so sore as might have moved some pity in the rocks. From sighs and shedding amber tears into sweet song she brake, when thus the echo answered her to every word she spake. O oh, heavens, who was the first that bred in me this fever? Fear. Who was the first that gave the wound whose fear I wear forever? Fear. What tyrant Cupid to my harm usurps thy golden quiver? Fear. What sight first caught this heart, and can from bondage it deliver? Fear. Yet who doth more, most adore this sight? O oh, hollow caves tell true. You. What nymph deserves his liking best, yet doth in sorrow rue? You. What makes him not reward good will with some reward or ruth? makes him show besides his birth such pride and such untruth. Youth. My eyes favor match with love, if he my love will try. I. May I requite his birth with faith, and faithful will I die. I. And I, that knew this lady well, said, Lord, how great a miracle to hear how Echo told the truth. As true as Phoebus' oracle. Ever so. The little love god lying once asleep laid by his side his heart in flaming brand, whilst many nymphs that vow chaste life to keep came tripping by, but in her maiden hand the fairest votary took up that fire which many legions of true hearts had warmed. And so the general of hot desire was sleeping by a virgin hand disarmed. This brand she quenched in a cool well by, which from love's fire took heat perpetual, growing a bath and healthful remedy for men diseased. But I, my mistress's thrall, came there for cure 
and this by that I prove: love's fire heats water; water cools not love. Thank、you